Okay, we'll get started. So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar. We're live here at AVNR in Montreal, Canada and Selro in, in Venendal, uh, Netherlands. Um, the title of the webinar is Unlocking Complete Automation Solutions for the Knee Implant Manufacturing. Um, so for those of you that know AVNR, we specialize in robotic finishing, visual inspection, and those are often the last element left to, to be able to really achieve a uh, full automation strategy. Um, everybody's got their plans and, and really want to adopt as much automation as possible. But, you know, transforming these manufacturing spaces into smart factories, it's not an easy task and take its, takes a really focused approach to innovation. Um, and, and that's kind of the way we set ourselves up. We, we identify what are some of the obstacles uh, through a, a lot of voice of the customer interviews and, and really getting out there and, and understanding what's going on and systematically you know, knocking off some of those areas and, and performing trials and testing. So our, our goal here today is to have an open discussion. You're gonna see some concepts. You're gonna hear from a, a great partner that we have in uh, the Netherlands Celro. Um, and we're gonna look at what was identified to us as obstacles for the ortho manufacturing space to, to really adopt automation in a big way. And some of the steps that, that we both took to solve them. Now we realize we may not have the full answers as everyone's reality is a little different. Um, so if you're an early adopter or you like to be part of these trials and iterations, this is a great place for you. Um, you're gonna get a chance to see some of the, the technologies that's evolved and uh, potentially be part of uh, this innovation and development. So before we get into it, a couple of housekeeping things. There is a chat box. So you can ask questions as we go through. We've left some time that uh, we'll take a few minutes at the end of the uh, of the material. We'll take some time to go through your questions and, and answer them best we can. Um, uh, and also there's an option to uh, highlight the panelists. So if, you're, if you find that the screen is too small, we'll be doing some screen sharing. You can uh, highlight the, the view and that will create a full screen uh, for you. Okay, we're going to kick things off first and hear a little bit about the, what the customers are saying. So we've got Julian Pierre. He heads up our business development in Europe. He's, he's headquartered uh, just outside Toulouse in France, and he's going to share with us some insights as to what uh, some of the customers are saying as some of the key obstacles. Hello, Mike. Hello, everybody. I'm glad to join you for this webinar, although I'll be quick as I'm currently traveling. You know, since a few months, uh, this is much more convenient to travel in Europe, still uh, being super cautious on safety measures, of course, but at least we can meet people and this is great. So I had a chance recently to meet different femoral knee manufacturers. It's interesting to see how they all have different manufacturing technologies, different process strategy. They all have different castings. They have more or less machining operation. They have all Okay, do you hear me now? Yeah, okay, sorry everyone, some technical difficulties as I do a few clicks here. We'll get this resolved. Okay. Hello Mike, hello everybody. I'm glad to join you for this webinar, although I'll be quick as I'm currently traveling. You know, since a few months, uh, this is much more convenient to travel in Europe, still uh, being super cautious on safety measures, of course, but at least we can meet people and this is great. So I had a chance recently to meet uh, different femoral knee manufacturers. It's interesting to see how they all have different manufacturing technologies, different process strategy. They all have different castings. They have more or less machining operation. They have also different polishing technologies. One thing in common though, they all are on their way to full automation. This is maybe something that is even more crucial in Europe than in North America. People here, they really target the lights out factory. If the reasons are all the same, like labor shortage, training cost, health issues, etc., 
the challenges are not quite the same depending on the product mix they have. What I generally feel also is that they are sometimes a bit cautious on robotic automation, in particular grinding, as in the past some installations were not very reliable and required a lot of programming skills. So in general, yes, they are really looking forward to a fully and reliable automated solution, including, if possible, grinding operation, and in particular, when existing, the difficult and technical box area of the condyle. Well, I'm pretty sure that this webinar will give you some ideas for solutions on these subjects. So I wish you insightful talks and hope to meet you in person in the near future. Yeah, so as uh, Julian mentioned, he's traveling today, so he wasn't able to join us, but uh, he did share some pretty important things and, and really what got us very excited about uh, this industry and where we felt that we had something to contribute. You know, the common theme that emerged was we had some, uh, the orthopedic manufacturing space, they were very open to technology. Um, often they had one robot uh, at least on their shop floor, uh, but there was still gaps, right? So like uh, Julian mentioned in the grinding, there's some tricky surfaces such as the box area. We'll have a chance to look at uh, this in more detail, but um, often uh, our customers, or the, the they were having to prepare the part so it was suitable for automation. And then afterwards, um, after this automated grind, uh, there was some touch-ups to do. So there was still some important gaps that, that were happening that were left for us to really dive into. And we felt that um, some of the tricks and tools that we had would play a big role in this, in this industry. Um, now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna introduce um, the concept that, uh, that we had put together so that everyone gets a flavor of, of what we're talking about as I introduce Celro, okay? So as we start to be able to do a, uh, a better job at um, processing these tricky areas, that unlocks the potential to do things like go straight from the grinder into finishing and start thinking about more automated tending. So as we got further into the development and, and getting some positive feedback from the industry, uh, that's when we, we had known Celro for a while and they're a fantastic company. Um, we started to see some real synergies of being able to really transform the manufacturing space. So it's this type of concept that you know, is, is what we see as the next step uh, going forward. So with that, I'd like to, to kick things over to Jem, Paul and Mark at Celro, live in the Netherlands. Um, they're not traveling today, they're with us. Um, Jem, Paul, he's a business unit manager at, at Celro, responsible for direct sales uh, in Benelux in Germany. He, together with his team, worked on many different requests regarding automation for metal industry in many different branches. Um, and Mark, he's also a business unit manager at Celro. Uh, he's specifically focused on the medical device space, and he, he and his team have developed a wide range of automation solutions for the industry. So uh, really happy to uh, kick this over to you, Jan Paul. Uh, thanks, Michael. And uh, uh, for all participants, welcome to the Netherlands. Welcome at Celro Automation. My name, as, as already uh, introduced by Michael, is Jan Paul van Veenendaal, and I'm responsible for all direct sales, which Celro takes in, in the Benelux countries and Germany. Uh, thanks all for joining, and uh, thanks specifically also to AVNR for organizing a webinar uh, to introduce our joint steps toward, towards full automation within the medical industry. A bit about Celro. Um, founded in 2003, uh, we are manufacturing automation solutions for the metal machining industry specifically. And Celro started out of its sister company called Chromatix, an established tool shop for injection molding and mold making. And sp more specifically, their need for flexible automation. Uh, right as we speak, uh, Celro consists of uh, 50 FTE and all hard and software issues uh, or software development takes place in-house Celro in the Netherlands. The focus, as you also see in the background, has always been uh, flexible and user-friendly automation. And that portfolio, what you see, exists of solutions from eight on the top left by Comet 
to 360 on the down right uh, at ultimate. And uh, these weights are then the robot handling weights. Besides product handling, uh, also pallet change, fixture exchange, and tool change are standard options for all of our uh, uh, robot cells. As stated, Celra has its head office in, the, in Veenendaal, the Netherlands, and also a branch office in Germany. And we are able to reach our end users on three different ways. We do the direct sales in Germany and the Benelux countries. The rest of Europe and the United States we cover through our dealers. And furthermore, we sell our automation by the machine tool manufacturers who are supplying our automation with their machines um, in, one, in one project. So that's in, in short, uh, cellular automation in the Netherlands. And I would also like to introduce my colleague, Mark Verwoerd, who is responsible for all medical business at, uh, within Celro. Mark, good afternoon or good morning for some of our participants. Can you please introduce yourself and explain what you do at Celro? Sure, thanks, Jean-Paul. Hello, everyone. My name is Mark Verwoerd. I'm a business, business unit manager at uh, Celro. Uh, together with my team, I look after our medical device customers uh, and their projects, of course. Um, so as a, as a company, uh, we focus primarily on machining integration, but uh, over the years, um, we have also ventured into other process areas such as uh, laser marking, cleaning, and today we're very excited to talk a little bit about uh, integrating finishing steps, uh, which you know is, is of interest to, to a variety of companies, but I think particularly to the medical device uh, companies. So Industry. I look forward to- um, Topic for today. Yeah, to discuss this in more detail uh, later on. Thanks. We will go later in, more into detail about the, that automation uh, that we will be discussing this afternoon. Uh, but first, back to AVNR. Uh, please, Michael. Great, thank you, Jan Paul. Okay, so we'll jump into the, the interesting parts today. Um, I'm going to give you guys a little walkthrough of how we approached going after some of the tricky areas of uh, the knee box area in terms of finishing. Um, so in this picture here, there's a grind machine, this is a machine tending, and then this is one of our uh, finishing systems. It's uh, for if you go on our website, it's the BFX 200 platform. Um, now there's a couple of key things that you know, as you iterate through trials and everybody is a, is a little bit unique um, in their production, in their castings, as, as Julian mentioned. Um, so there's some key things that, the key challenges that we identified here. So, so I've got a video of a um, demonstration of configuration and processing of a knee uh, femoral. Now, Key thing here is this box area for the, if you can, it's kind of on an angle, but there's a box area that's really difficult to get into. Uh, there's a lot of tight radiuses, and then there's a cam area that has very curved surface and it blends out into the radius. So it's a really challenging application. I've seen it done uh, a few times by hand and you've got to be a really skilled operator to get at this properly. Now there's a couple of steps to this. There is, after machining, there's a rough uh, grind or a belting operation, which is to remove machining lines. And then there's uh, a buffing operation. Uh, what we're gonna be looking at, focus on today is more the belting operation. So unlocking that potential. So right out of the grinder, you're able to get those machining lines out and then go further down the processing, okay? The screen you're looking at here is really the core of uh, the machine. So this is um, uh, built right into the machine. It, it comes in offline packages as well to help with the tuning if you have multiple part numbers. But this is really where a lot of the magic happens. So you're able to split this knee into features um, and then create a path or a number of paths per feature. And then along the left bottom here, this is where uh, the control points are put in. So if you want to adjust your feeds, your speeds, your pressures, this is really where the magic and the power of being able to fine tune this system goes. Um, often we look at the, there's a robot in the middle, but the machines we've created are a little bit more than just a robot system. We, we view these as process machines, you know, being able to do these abrasive processes. So here we're focusing on the back walls. I'm just gonna back that up a little bit. There's, there's two paths that go into this. 
Um, there is the cam path that we're going to demonstrate, and there's also the the box, one of the box walls. Um, and you can see uh, we're able to quickly and visually grab which points we want to modify and modify parameters associated with that and, and quickly iterate through that process development. There's also a simulation built right into the software. So before you run it, you can validate, is this path process going to run into, into any collisions, any singularities, and am I going in the right direction? Um, once that's done, that reality check is done. This, this also allows you to work at your desk as opposed to on the machine. Um, once that's done, then it goes, gets downloaded to the robot. Um, those paths get processed and, and sent over and the actual process happens. Um, so there's there's a few parameters here. The, the belt uh, and the belt wear is all controlled. So, you know, knee to knee, you want to make sure that you guarantee this process. And there's a few variables that go into this. Um, so abrasive wear is critical. Um, the amount of force that's applied is also critical because these are castings. So there will be some variability in the shape. So we're able to compensate with that uh, for that as that robot processes the part. Now, the one other thing that we found uh, really interesting about the orthopedic market is we spend a lot, we've traditionally spent a lot of time in the aerospace, but the, the quality systems between the two industries were quite similar. These are, you know, highly regulated industries and these parts are critical. So in, in the case of an aircraft, you know, those are, if something goes wrong, that plane is potentially uh, crashing. In the case of orthopedic, these are being implanted in a person's uh, body, so the quality is of most importance. So understanding your process, being able to fine tune things on complex parts is, is important, uh, and managing the, the system in production is also very, very important. So we created some features to help manage that and make it easy. Um, this is a demonstration of uh, one feature within the software called Part Compare. And what it allows you to do is, let's say you have a, we're looking at the condyle surface of this part. We have a number of paths. Um, and let's let's say during your process, this casting varies. So all of a sudden at the, the back end of the machine, you start to see uh, quality variations. This allows you to understand what is going on uh, within this machine. Um, everyone's, you know, there's a lot of buzz going around industry 4.0 topics and, and big data. So we view this machine as also an information system that can really give you uh, a lot of data and a, a lot of insights as to what's happening during this abrasive process. So in order to get some of those insights, you know, us as people, as humans, we're, we're really visual people. So you, what you do is you, you put on the compare mode, you select which parts you want to analyze, and you select the feature. In this case, we're looking at the, the force. And visually, very quickly, you can compare what happened on the different parts. So we've had customers use this tool to realize that maybe a core shifted in their casting, and that created on the external part a, a deviation. And there was no blue light scan at that step in the process. But we started to see some variations within the, our machine. So we were able to go into the data, analyze, that there was a force issue and when we started looking at the surface of the part there we realized that there is there is casting issues with this so this really unlocks the potential of not only using this machine as a as a uh, uh, processing unit but it's a troubleshooting uh, device as well too with all this and these are all building blocks to to a smart factory i just got a message to check the chat so i'm just going to Good. I'm going to continue here. Thank you. Now, we talked a lot about finishing. Uh, I also give a little insight into visual inspection. So that's the other technology vertical that we get into. So um, uh, in our concept at the moment, this is not included. This is typically towards the back end of the processing. So a final knee, a final 
uh, part that's ready to be packaged. So it's it's been buffed, it's been cleaned, and it's it's ready to go. Um, we're looking for nicks, stained scratches, missed operations on this. The big breakthrough that happened over, uh, let's say, the past two years is really around tack time. Um, when we tried this type of application because of the super shiny surface, our cycle times were up you know, anywhere 30 to 45 minutes because of the number of positions we needed to inspect this part. Today, thanks to some of the algorithms and some of the uh, imaging techniques, uh, we're able to do this in under a minute, a minute and a half. So this becomes a really viable opportunity to leverage inside the manufacturing space. And you can see from some of the defects here, uh, there's some pretty interesting uh, quality improvements uh, that you gain because of this, uh, ensuring that those parts go into your customer are of the, the highest quality. And that's just another example of you know a, a building block that really has the potential to unlock uh, going to lights out automation, a, a, a larger automation strategy. Okay, so that gives you an overview of the AVNR portion of the um, the building blocks we put together. Now I'd like to hand it back to Selro, Yampal, and Mark to talk a little bit about their their solutions and how that f fits into the big picture. Thanks again, Michael. Um, as stated, uh, I, I would now like to present more in detail our our accelerate, uh, which you see on the on the left side of the screen. And having seen our portfolio in my earlier uh, presentation, we would now like to focus on the newest member of the accelerate family, the X35. For such, it is important to explain a little about uh, accelerate strategy in general. Accelerate has been developed with the goal to actually assist the operator to take the repetitive work, to take over the repetitive work. And the machine needs to stay open for manual work and should enable our customers to work in high mix, low volume strategies. Accelerate is exactly that answer, combining a small footprint with a large capacity and flexibility. But over the last years, there has been a growing request for also side loading next to front loading and for example, higher storage capacities. And even more important, combining two machines on one automation. This has all led to the development of the X35. It combines all these features of Accelerate to different kinds of machine tools like milling, turning, grinding, or like in this case with AVNR, finishing operations. X35 consists, as you see on the left side of the screen, um, a, base, a basic frame consisting of a draw module for workpieces, the four you see in the, behind the robot. And on top of that, some shelves for storing pallets, fixtures, and on top of that, also grippers. The specific robot position in this case enables the connecting of two machines and technologies, uh, as stated, like finishing with AVNR. The drawer module consists of up to eight drawers, eight guideways with the flexibility to combine uh, several drawers. You can take out these drawers, enabling the manufacturing or the handling of higher workpieces. Furthermore, the storage on top of the drawer modules uh, for pallets, fixtures, and grippers are stated uh, behind the robot. Uh, safety, you cannot quite see in this picture, but it's on the bottom. Uh, and it guarantees the safety for the operator. Once you go in, uh, the, the scanner recognizes your position and will uh, reduce the speed of the robot or eventually stop. But of course, full enclosure is also one of the possibilities. In the middle, in this case, you also see a centering unit where we also take the opportunity to turn pieces if necessary for a second operation. So this frame, uh, can easily be extended for extra storage, extra shelves for pallets, fixtures, and grippers once wished or necessary. So then we go to the front side. You see the operator uh, position enabling to 
to take out the drawer for manually uh, loading and unloading raw material or finished pieces. Pieces. All this flexible hardware gets supported, of course. Can you please turn the cell, colleague? Yes. All those flexible hardware solutions get supported, of course, by a very user-friendly uh, HMI, human machine interface. The operator can easily configure new jobs, including new designs for inlay to be optimized the, uh, and adapt to different work pieces, but also finger, fingers can easily be configured, manufactured, and attached. So automatic change of fixtures, pallets, and grippers are possible within the job management system. On top of that, Cellro has a lot of experience adding additional processes to a machine robot combination. Our system is completely open for extra depth of automation like inspection, cleaning, and also the combination AVNR finishing. Having seen the images shown before, and more specifically this model, automation of medical workpieces from raw to completely finished gets within reach with the steps we are making together with AVNR. To this point, let me please again introduce Mark for Wood uh, for a more detailed explanation of reflecting on the specific requirements um, uh, within the medical industry. Sure, Mark. Thank, thanks, uh, Jan Paul. Yeah, yeah. So I would like to discuss uh, a few use cases that we that we have discussed with our customers that I believe are typical of. Uh, some of the medical device uh, manufacturers uh, needs. So the key piece actually I would like to talk about yeah. now is, is data integrity, which is sort of a key requirement for the industry, right? And uh, we have developed several hardware and software options that uh, sort of ensure that the data uh, is, is protected and uh, the integrity is guaranteed, right? Yeah. So first and foremost, at the physical level, when you look at the drawers and when you load material into your systems, um, we ensure that uh, any, any one drawer can be subdivided into inlays or, or part carriers that are segregated from one another, right? So if yeah. you have a batch of parts coming in, let's say castings coming in, um, you know, we want to make sure that they're separate, physically separate, right? We, we have seen that in the, in the overview of the complete combination, the drawers separated for different batches. Correct, yeah. correct. So we can subdivide each, basically inlay each drawer into uh, several compartments, uh, which are physically separate from one another, right? Yeah. So that, that's a key thing. But then beyond that, uh, what we have also as a software option is something we call batch registration, right? So batch registration is really about uh, being able to um, provide input to the system, identify your batch by means of uh, a scanning procedure, right? So uh, typically a batch comes with, with paperwork, right? So we have uh, a lot number, a product code, uh, a quantity, maybe a trace code, all this information has to be input into the system. And uh, well, you can either input it manually, yeah. uh, but many of our customers prefer that this is done kind of automatically through scanning, right? So we have a, a batch registration module, which, which takes care of that, which uh, you know, many of our medical uh, customers use. Mm -hmm. um, on top of that, again, then we have uh, what we call the batch verification module, right? So batch yep. verification is about, um, uh, well, at the level that we are currently working on it, is about making sure that the batch has the right number of parts. Right, so if you scan your uh, batch uh, paperwork, um, you know it's it might say you have 11 parts in this batch. Um, then you actually uh, we have a vision system which which just basically counts that uh, the, the the batch has the correct number of parts. Yeah, uh, that's that's like a high level check, right? And then uh, one final check that we can offer to our customers is uh, what we call the part verification check. Yeah. And this is really where we check that uh, the part that's been loaded is the correct part. So typically this happens at the level of individual parts. So when the robot picks a part from the drawer, um, we have um, means of sort of identifying or verifying that the part meets, uh, I suppose, the, the specifications uh, that we expect. Huh? So this could be a dimension check by means yeah. of a sensor. Could be a vision system, which uh, this looks at at, uh, at the contour of the part, or a combination of these technologies, making sure it's making the right sure one. that this is the right uh, the right part going in, right? So, from that, you know, after that, it's a closed system. Uh, every uh, all the data is, uh, is sort of uh, built into uh, our data model, which is uh, yeah uh, secure. Yeah. Um, so uh, data is safe with us, and we also have an outfeed verification step 
which means that as, as the batch is output out of the system, we check that the right number of parts are uh, in the batch. And so like we know plant. that, you know, as a closed system, it is, uh, it is secure and your data is safe. So that just is one example uh, of a use case that we uh, worked out with our customers. And there's a couple of other things that unfortunately we don't have time to go into, but uh, perhaps uh, next time we can. Uh, it's the extension of here. how we implement. It's all built on top of our standard products. Within a medical uh, device. Exactly, right. We have a very powerful standard portfolio, um, but yeah, there are certain use cases that we need to address as well in order for these products to be applied in the medical space. And so that's that's what we've been working on for more than a decade, and uh, it's been very successful and exciting. Very clear to me. I hope also for our participants, but I'm, I'm very uh, relying on that. Cool. Uh, thanks, Mark. And um, uh, I would say the, the the word back to Avi and I. Yeah, that's great, guys. Um, before we get into the questions, I, you know, I picked up on one thing from um, from what you were saying, Mark. Um, you talked a lot about you know using vision systems to to validate features, maybe do some measurements. Um, that's certainly one of the f feedback that we heard that, you know, because uh, at, when we saw a person manually uh, belting a box area, for example, they would have to maybe check wall thicknesses, the opening of the box. So, you know, that seems to be an important element to being able to automate, fully automate this is, is that check did, the machine do its job properly. So um, maybe just, you could talk a little bit about what you've seen uh, in terms of what what's the benefits of some of these uh, measurements and in, in, in the medical device context. Sure, yeah, just to be clear, um, we don't uh, properly uh, detect uh, any defects and such. Uh, all we're interested in is verifying that the part that's what's loaded is in fact the correct part. Okay. So um, one typical application is in laser marking. So we have developed laser marking technology, basically uh, an automated uh, laser marking system where we uh, load in parts and we have to be, make absolutely sure that uh, the correct part goes in. So um, in our experience, depending on the, the, the variation in parts, uh, we need multiple uh, projections in order to uh, separate one or sort of, uh, I'd say, uh, distinguish one part from another part, right? So um, we don't uh, look at, uh, let's say, surface details, but we look at, uh, I don't know, the width, the, the, the height, maybe certain features, like is a box present, is a box not present? Um, sometimes uh, contour matching, and we look for certain specific features using blob techniques and, 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 and things like that. So it's really uh, the key uh, requirement is that we have to distinguish one part from another. So in that sense, I guess it's, it's somewhat different from the technologies that, uh, uh, that you have developed, am I right? Yeah, so we're focused on the visual inspection portion is, is really focused on looking for nicks, stains, scratches, those type of quality defects. Um, but certainly the minute that somebody realizes they can detect all those, then they say, okay, well, I want to measure a feature. And I like your approach because there's a practical touch to that. Um, we, because the robot is holding the part often, we kind of shy away from talking about full metrology. Um, so go no go type of inspections, you know, is the the box area about the right size? Those I think are very um, simple but very powerful things you can do as checks along the process. So having that practical touch, where maybe at that moment you don't need a full 3D scan of the part and comparing it uh, to the CAD model, you just need to validate. Okay, am I in the right zone that I'm confident that this part can move on to the next step? And that that check is 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 quite powerful. Um, that being said, you know I, there is customers looking for those full 3D scans, and I have to say that technology has has come a long way, and there's a lot of great potential out there for um, integrating contact, both contact and non-contact, in this type of environment. So um, there is solutions that are that are coming to the forefront that uh, we're pretty excited about. Um, now we do have some. Uh, questions coming in from the uh, uh, the attendees here. So uh, maybe if you want to stay there, maybe Jan Paul wants to come back out because there's, a, from what I see here, there's a few questions for all of us. Um, I'll start with one from for you guys. Um, 
Is it possible to add some form of pre-cleaning between the machining operation and the finishing operation to get rid of the coolant and other machining residue? May I? Yeah. Sure, go ahead. Yeah. Um, adding additional processes um, is not only a third parties, uh, 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 hardware and software. Um, I didn't I didn't mention that, but cleaning is not only part of the robot within the machine, cleaning and leaving all the all the all the coolant and all the chips within the machine area, but we can also extend that to a cleaning box outside of the machine in the automation area where we put um how do you say passively uh, uh, by a robot handling the part in and with uh, air blow or uh, even uh, uh, cleaning within a bath it's it's all kind of typical features that we can simply add from hardware but also software point of view so in process cleaning is is a known feature for cellular automation okay great yeah uh, there's one for us. It, does grinding also include belting processes? So we have a lot of fun with language. Um, you know, what someone calls grinding, sometimes they mean deburr. And when we say deburr, they, they think it's grinding, versus, vice versa. And, and there's many different types of a, what we call abrasive processes. We're, we, we work a lot with uh, 3M and they've put together, they, they did a, a whole webinar on this, just the kind of the language of abrasive processes. Um, so what we're calling grinding, so from what we've seen, typically these, let's say a knee femoral, it's a cast part. Um, then there's some machinery or grinding to, to get rid of um, uh, the gates on the part, and then it enters the machining line. This machining line is typically used to bring, uh, there's typically one to two millimeters left over of the gate and bring that down as close as they can to the surface and maybe touch up some of the uh, articulating surface. Then uh, from there, that's where the uh, belting process comes in. And you've, the, the goal of the belting process is really to remove those machine lines uh, and to ensure that you know, the, the box opening, for example, is within, uh, is large enough, but of course not too big. So typically that belting process is you know, anywhere from two to three belts, uh, different iterations of belts, and in order to get to the right surface finish and prepare it for uh, the buffing operation. Now, one of the interesting things we found is uh, after belting, sometimes people have to rebend their parts. Um, so that's one of our focus areas is uh, to tune our process to allow, to ensure there's not enough heat going into that part to deform it. And if, if we can achieve that, that really um, uh, eliminates a full step of a bend and inspection process and FPI, because the minute that you recorrect that part, you potentially have to look for, did you create any cracks in the part? So there's a real opportunity for some uh, uh, game changing uh, step change here that uh, could really unlock um, uh, much better efficiency and a greater throughput for the the machine so we're really interested to continue down that path and see see what the fruit uh, what fruit it brings um, the buffing process if I can talk to, about that that's a different uh, so we sometimes call it ultra polish and that's typically using cotton wheels with some form of paste and that's also uh, a key focus for AVNR um, our goal is to really eliminate all of these these processes uh, hand finishing processes few more questions came in, so we'll keep rolling here. Um, one for you, uh, Jan, Paul, and Mark. It looks like anyone can access the loading drawers in the X35 system. Is there a way to prevent unauthorized access? Should I, do I take the answer? Go for it, yeah. Um, of course. There are several several industries in in metal machining. This is not in standard metal machining. This is not the the, the biggest issue. Uh, we can perfectly understand that in medical industry, that's a uh, that's another issue or feature uh, which is requested. Um, there are multiple solutions uh, to to uh, to do such. Um, you can think of all, of, of all medical solutions like like uh, door opening, etc. 
to secure that level of making failure of, of exchanging pieces, et cetera. Uh, elimination uh, of that risk is, is key. And that's what we recognize uh, being active within the medical industry. So um, yeah, it, um, uh, possible to realize for, so, for sure. Yeah, but just briefly add on to that. As it goes back to what I was talking about before, we do have additional modules that will help uh, make sure that no mix up took place. Right? So whenever new parts are loaded into the system, if somebody were to uh, I know, mix them up, uh, we would always catch that using our uh, vision based technology. Yeah, clear. Um, so, yeah. And, and, and maybe, maybe some additional uh, for that. It's hardware and software related. So, also uh, uh, operator level entry uh, 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 or user user level entries, etc. Um, and it can 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 all be uh, included, for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So, you guys have different uh, password protection for operator for users uh, engineering level. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We we operate this a similar way. So, we find um, sometimes you know. Adjusting process parameters can be good, but it can also be detrimental. So, you know, let's say it's a midnight shift, and uh, maybe you don't want to vary any process parameters, and maybe you do, and maybe you want to log that. So, there's a lot of uh, thinking around making sure you have a good uh, a good system to to enable these changes when it's uh, when it's the right time. Um, and along that, yeah. uh, another question here is how easy are these systems to program? Um, I can maybe start and then I'll kick it over to you guys. Um, our goal, you know, we've we even made it our slogan to humanize robotics. So, and what that means is we're really trying to make it easy to, for uh, people to use our systems and, and not only just people at large, it's, we're really focused on, you know, the, the folks that know these hand processes. So we want this to be a tool for somebody that is, uh, finishing knows the finishing really well, so it's intuitive for them to come use our system and use it as a tool to uh, improve or scale their process. Um, so that being said, we put a lot of effort into that. Uh, we find it easier to use than it used to be, but for sure, that's an ongoing theme that uh, as we as we go forward and, and gather feedback, there's a lot of different uh, tricks that we we've got in the pipeline to to help make these easier. How about you guys? May I? Go for it. Uh, at Accelerate, the challenge has always been to combine high flexibility with a user-friendly interface. It's the machine operator operating also or, or configuring the, the, the robot automation. And what they are used to is a dialogue control. So what we, provi what we are providing is a dialogue control graphically supported, um, enabling, however, to configure uh, and manufacture your own inlays to adapt to specific work pieces. The one and only necessary data is, is the, uh, the number of rows and the number of columns. Um, but that's directly supported in X epsilon set, so not in the six axis six axis robot programming. Um, machine clamping systems are a separate field of this configuring uh, of a total job. It's all X, Y, Z, and it's all supported by graphics. So an experienced or an experienced uh, Celero Accelerate user can do that within minutes. And uh, all low risk or, or, or low level X, Y, Z programming like they are used to from their machine tool. Um, but still, keeping the possibility of changing those inlays, changing those dripper fingers, changing the machine clamping system without having any, any contact at cell row for reprogramming the, the, the interface. So um, user-friendly uh, combined with, with uh, maximum flexibility, I would say. Okay, great. That's, in short, the summary of our control. Okay. Okay, and another question came up. So, and I'm in order so, sorry, to answer. Sorry, sorry. One, one, yeah. One, one addition more. On Accelerate, you have of of course the the the, the FANUC robot controller. Hmm. Um, 
that's back and that's back in the system we never an operator never uses it um, yeah. uh, there's a hmi doing all the transitions to the robot controller um executing all the processes so she, so you never have to touch the teach pendant of the robot controller in normal operation yeah uh, we found that to be really important because you know when we put something on our customer's floor there's always training that goes with it so if the customer is good they can take this system teach new parts and in fact we've got a few customers that you know a couple of years later they come back and say mike you know what look what i've done with your system you guys told me i couldn't do this and they kind of they get it and they're able to actually innovate with it so we we love those stories um but you know the training level in order to use one of our systems um by avoiding the need to touch a teach pendant that goes a long way to making it easier to to use not to say that the robot companies aren't doing a good job of you know building out their software and you're starting to see the collaborative robots becoming super easy but it's just one extra element that people sometimes need to learn so by making the our interface intuitive and you know being able to graphically modify points and, and move things around that allows them to focus on some of these process details so that that kind of triggers off what you said uh, Jan Paul um, for the next question I'm going to share the screen again because it is a technical question so they start asking us uh, it's been asked here what is the overall footprint of the proposed solution so maybe you want to talk about the footprint of your x35 the x35 uh, I, I will take the the, the question um, as a, a width of 1.6 meter, 1.63 uh, uh, to be exact. We need some moving space left and right. I'm also checking the picture to explain. Um, the machine on the left is an example being 1.6 meter. So uh, having said that, the footprint of the total I estimate as 5.5 times 5 or 5 times 5 meter in total. Um, in which you can see the the, the, the X35 has uh, uh, three sides of, of, of possible combinations. So um, like a puzzle, uh, uh, as long as the robot reach, reaches the, uh, the, the clamping system in both machine and AVNR, then uh, uh, every freedom of in layout is, is possible. But of course, it's depending on the, on the shop floor and specifically in this case, we took advantage of the position of the operator being on the front side in uh, in, in all three elements. Yeah, yeah. So the 5.5, you're including all three machines in the layout that we're showing here. Yeah, yeah. You know, and that's that's pretty small. So in when I was describing some of the grinding processes um, and even some of the belting, I've seen robot systems just for those processes upwards of 5.5 by themselves because they've got a big strong robot in the center uh, when you get into the heavy processes such as removing the gates that that's needed when you get into the belt processes um, we found um, the 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 smaller robots do a very good job you can be much more sensitive on the, the force controls and that allows less heat going into the part so reducing that footprint there's a big gain for customers saving space on their shop floor you know typically space is uh is critical they're often packed with many machine tools um inspection areas so there's not a lot of space to work with so th that's one of the things i like about this uh footprint and what you guys bring to the table too is it's very efficient in terms of layout and uh compresses things a lot so you get a, a lot of things happening in a small area you know? Um, you guys talked a little Try bit to about build vertically. Yeah. yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And then the storage, and you guys talked a little bit about um, the the ability to uh, store some of the like the machine tools inside of your uh, X35. Um, I really like that concept because you know can we also store some of the abrasives? Is one of the questions in, in the chat. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, one typical standard feature that we offer with, with our uh, standard products is, is fixture exchange on, uh, let's say, milling machines, right? Um, so I think in the same way, we can, we can explore, um, you know, changing out, um, uh, well, let's say, belting equipment or other equipment that you use on your machine so that we can, we can support that 24-7 workflow uh, even better. Right. So, um, yeah, it's definitely something we can, we can explore. In, in, in principle, the capability is there, the data model, the software allows it. Exactly. Um, so it, it's really a matter of, uh, you know, uh, sitting together and working this out in detail and to see what it entails exactly. X, X35, uh, including two machines, exchanging um, uh, work pieces, exchanging fixtures, and also exchanging tools is a is a, a, a something we realized so it's it's possible within software and hardware the tool change is done specifically for avnr of course a mechanical um, uh, a challenge or or possibility uh, but from software point of view it's certainly possible can you guys automate cleaning of a dust collector that's a loaded question that that's a dream of ours that uh, you know, full lights out automation. You, we have there's often dust collection going on, so uh, uh, that's a dream down the road. We want fully automated dust collection, cleaning, changing the filters. Uh, we'll get there one day, but uh, I don't I don't expect it right now. Well, guys. if you say if you say it's operator functionality and it's repeatedly uh, uh, coming back, then I would say it's the biggest challenge. It's 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 one of the challenges that that should be automated. Yeah. But uh, that doesn't mean I have the detailed answer yet. But... Great, great. So we're getting close to the end of the hour here. Um, I'm just gonna switch the screen so we can get to contact information. Now, um, as I mentioned during the uh, uh, the intro, uh, right now we don't play, pretend to have all the answers to everything. Everyone's production shop floor reality is a little bit different. Um, there was a question about adding uh, cleaning. Um, potentially somebody wants to add the buffing as well too, or different forms of inspection. So, you know, this is an open conversation to stimulate some ideas, uh, show everybody what we're working on. Uh, by all means, work out. You can, if you have questions you want to ask one-on-one, -on -one, um, really happy to hear from you. Um, if you have any critiques or you just love technology and you want to, uh, put in your two cents, be great to hear from you. Um, with that, all that being said, I'd like to thank Mark and Jan Paul for, for your time today and being live. Um, appreciate it, everything. Any last words you guys want to give? So just to reiterate what you said, Michael, uh, we're really keen to, to work with yourselves and develop this technology more, but ultimately we need those use cases from our customers. So if there's any customers out in the chat or who, who want to participate in one way or another, um, you know, we, we we definitely welcome your input and we look forward to working with you. It's been our pleasure. Thanks for the possibility to be able to uh, uh, to introduce Salro. Yeah. yeah, great. And, you know, we uh, travel is, is much better. Um, so I look forward to uh, last week, Philip uh, from our shop, he, he did a nice trip in Europe. He did a tour of England and uh, France and Italy. So uh, looking forward to coming coming across and seeing you guys. Um, with that, everybody, thank you very much for your time and for, for listening in. Um, we look forward to hearing from you and have a great day.